All right. Thank you, Steve, for being part of Raising Clarity's holiday interview series. And it's 2023. It's December 2023. And I'm really excited and grateful to be speaking to you. So I call you. you my friend Steve Light, and you go by Slart. Yeah, that's right. Do you, yeah. do you feel like speaking about that just for a second? What is what is that for you? Yeah, I knew you. I had a feeling you would ask that. Yeah, know. it's such an interesting name. Um, I don't know. I saw the importance of having a brand for myself, and it, and in a way, it was a way to kind of also protect myself. As you know, mm. I, I see myself as quite a shy person, even though I'm probably not. I'm just remembering that I used to be. So if the idea of an art brand is something that's in front of me that's kind of hiding Steve Light away. Uh, but the actual name, Steve, the actual name Slart itself is Steve Light Art, joined together into one powerful word. Um, There's also a connotation. There's the denotation, what you've just explained. Mm. But Slart ha carries with it a certain... So Slarty Barkfast, does that name ring a... <laughs> yeah, I heard of so, that. I don't actually know what that is. Okay, right. <laughs> there's a there's a connotation of Slart that's slightly... I think it's slightly derogatory or oh. slightly self-deprecating more. Oh, okay. and, and I think... So I'm going to screen share something. Um, and this is a pretty hilarious... Um, <laughs> take on an art invitation right you said um he had wanted to make it i forget how you put it but sort of not pretentious yeah something like that and yeah. i thought well you couldn't you couldn't have a less pretentious one right and you guys <laughs> are, are really doing it up of sort of not being pretentious yeah i thought it no. was quite funny so slart to me has a little bit of a wink to it it's a little bit of an edge um, a lot of artists, at least I think the stereotype is that they're kind of self-aggrandizing. Mm. And I think you are kind of the opposite. I don't know. what do you, Is that any of that possible? Very true. Yeah, I like to be self-deprecating and, and a bit cheeky. I was always mysteri uh, mysterious. Freud that's true, shit. too. I uh, think that's mysterious, great. Yeah, I mean, mischievous. But yeah, definitely mysterious and a bit. So... Um, your sort of paragraph, very short description on Substack includes the phrase, writing about my return to art after 20 years. And then I bold, and I want to talk about that in a minute, but I, I also bold faced this part. Um, I also explore the gap between the societal pressures of a real job and the creative pursuits we crave. A really great, the Substack post specifically, where you write about that, I think quite yeah. a bit which was a beauty, the time will pass anyway. So I, I work a lot with money. I think that's, you know that. And yeah. I work with money and jobs and fundraising and all those things, how to pull together the funds to do what you want to do. Yeah. And so do you, I think that's edgy. Do you think that's edgy? And do you think it's interesting? Where's the edge in, for you, in trying to blend or balance those two things? And those, you might not feel that you blend them. You might not feel that you balance them. I don't know. Do you, do you want to say anything mm. about that? Before I do, what what did you see that was edgy about that? I think it's an edge people, most people are scared of and won't go to, to be really blunt. For me, it's normal to, to want to stretch, do something you love, and not necessarily monetize it right away. Mm. And, and certainly need money. Not, I don't just work for people with a lot of money. I do work for some. Um, and we all think that would be great, but it isn't always that great. So a lot of people have to do this, this balancing act that you talk about. And they're very familiar with the gap between a real job and the creative pursuits. And then you bring in societal pressure that it isn't just ourselves that we have to worry about. It's um, the real job. And you have real job in quotation marks on your substack. Yeah. And the creative pursuit, right, that is important mm. to us, that we crave, actually. I think that's a pretty legit word. Yeah. And when we talk about a gap, I mean, I'm very visual. There is an, there is an actually an edge. And some people get very close to that edge, but they don't really, they don't really hang out at the edge. Whereas yeah. I see you really pushing yourself practically over into the gap. 
I mean, you've taken yeah. some risks. You have a family, so you're very mm. careful. Yeah, it's definitely ingrained. It's, I think part of why I didn't carry on my art career when I was younger was the pressure. There wasn't any explicit pressure from my parents, but just seeing people around me kind of settling for for jobs because they had to get a job. And I didn't see a clear path of having an art career, so I just took any job I could, um, started working on building sites, and then slowly moved into office environment and et cetera and technology and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But I think when I share my posts with some people, they're quite happy having the two distinct parts of having a full-time job. Then they know they they can create freely Mm. outside of their work hours but I don't I don't I feel satisfied temporarily but I know that I can do so much more having 40 plus hours a week really focused on my work it, I'm just excited about how much deeper and how much further I can go with having that time how much I've achieved so far with just limited amounts of time and I want to push the envelope with that um and sometimes I feel guilty about that. Sometimes I think I I shouldn't be pursuing leaving my job to uh, start an art career, but there's something deeper which is nudging me in that direction. So there are, I would say, voices telling you you shouldn't, and maybe I'm guessing voices saying you're self-indulgent, you shouldn't for that reason. You oh, yeah, be... definitely. It does yeah. feel self-indulgent, especially... Mm -hmm when you because i'm quite sensitive hear, hearing about people struggling and and there's me complaining about having a fairly decent job and not being satisfied because i'm not doing my art career it's kind of quite a privileged position to be in really isn't it well um, yeah i think it privilege is, but, is a blessing i i refer to yeah. i have a blog post about how privilege is a blessing yeah that we can't make privilege go away by waving a wand and ignoring it it's like we have it so we might as well yeah. work it um right so there's these voices over here but there's mm. something in you that is undying and, yeah. um, you know, here in the U.S., we think everybody with a British accent is wealthy. I know that's an idiotic <laughs> stereotype. And I don't think you grew up wealthy. And I don't think I think you have a good job, a stable job. Mm. And and that's a blessing or privilege, like you say. But did you grow up wealthy? No, not at all. Um, my parents were working class. Um, we weren't short of money. My Well, my dad was a painter and decorator, then a taxi driver. Then he set up his own taxi business. Um, hmm. So I might get that kind of entrepreneurial streak pushing yeah. against um, settling for working for someone else from him, seeing what he was doing, um, just imbibing that when I was growing up, I guess. Um, but no, he, he, they both died penniless, basically. Um, hmm. uh, didn't buy a house or anything kind of frivolous with money as well um my dad liked to go down the betting shop i think i told you about that before um that was the way he liked to spend his time so um so when i said privilege i wasn't like mm. i know some people who they leave university and they go straight into a job because their dad knows someone at the company or something like that but i never had that i had to really struggle where i couldn't I couldn't work for for years because I was just really nervous and had quite a lot of anxiety. So I was picking up jobs where I could hide away, working in building sites and stuff like that. Um, but I feel privileged. Like I've, I've been able to get to a position where I'm, um, I've got a fairly secure job and I'm be able to to create in my spare time. I'm very when I say this out loud, I'm very very grateful that I can sustain myself and be creative separately which is pretty amazing right like if we think about your ancestors and what mm. they went through it's not yeah. something at all that was preordained mm. it's nothing anyone would have thought oh good and in this generation steve light will get to be an artist 
a professional working artist. So when you when we talk about the voices, I think class background is something that we don't talk about much, but yeah. I think in the US, but I think it's extremely important. I also come from a working class background. Yeah. My my parents' generation were striving to be middle class. Um, my father had a PhD. But mm. my grandparents were both immig were immigrants on both sides. They were, yeah. I'm second generation US. And so those voices that that pull us down include class voices, the voices of, of the, the sort of the idea that it's self-indulgent might not occur yeah. to someone who grew up um, owning class, who grew up wealthy. It might be like, well, I guess I'll take the money from my parents' legacy and this is how I'll use it. Yes, there will be risks, even for someone like that. But you don't have that. Mm. And I think for anyone listening to this who didn't come from a wealthy background, I think it's very inspiring to watch you sort of duke it out with um, the voices. And so what is there, as again, when I say there's a voice in you that's undying, that mm. really says, I will do this. I mean, I, I know you and I've read enough of your work, not besides seeing your work, but read your written work to know there have been oscillations. There have been rises and falls in your ability to give yourself to your art. And some yeah. of those demons are internal. I'm yeah. um, feeling like I'm not, you know, I can't do it. I shouldn't do it. I'm not going to do it. But I know that you will do it. Hmm. And I'm watching you do it step by step building. Yeah. So there's that edge. And can you speak at all to it, what I'm calling the undying voice? I don't know how you would call it. But the thing that will not go away and will not be satisfied until you are making your art professionally, full time. I think it's partly. I have no idea where it came from because it. All I know is that when I was very young, I was drawing all the time and I didn't copy that from anyone. It'd be different if I had artist parents. I saw them drawing and then I assimilated that, but my parents weren't creative in that respect at all. And I never saw anyone else draw any adults around me. Mm. So it must, there must be some kind of natural or biological thing. Um, my biological grandmother, which I, who I got to know um, very briefly over the past 15 years since I met my biological dad, she was quite the creative and painter and stuff. So I don't, who knows, it could have been, somewhat biological in my DNA but that's part of it and I think ever since I was probably about 18 I I had I had a deep knowing that I'm destined for kind of bigger things um not in like an arrogant way at all I just I knew that I couldn't settle for just working in a job for all of my life I had to do something bigger um, and I can't explain what that was exactly, but I knew I couldn't, I couldn't settle. All right. So, so when you were 16, your art teacher said you couldn't draw. So here you yeah. are as this little child drawing. So mm -hmm. I got, I'm doing this art mentoring and I wrote my, rewrote my bio and the big, mm -hmm. the big feature in my bio was talking about that art teacher. And then I showed it to this guy who's a professional curator and, mentor in the states and he mm. he said why don't you take that out it just gives the power away to him so I took mm. that out and, and I it's not like I don't talk about it now but it's not part of my central bio I don't want to I it does make sense when he said that not no, to it's, get, it's great if you're redefining yeah. yourself is that not being so important anymore yeah I think that's also a milestone it's great for people to know that that happened to you and yeah. you surmounted it but the edge isn't there anymore for you yeah um so yeah, I, I remember it vividly. So we were doing, uh, we had to do a large scale drawing project. Um, so I'm not talking mural size, but it was like, uh, I don't know, about a meter sheet of paper by half a meter or something like that, which is big for kind of yeah, that, that kind of level um, for drawing at uh, early A level class. Um, so I started drawing a scene of my, bedroom door so I had my bedroom door and it was um it's supposed to be a um documentation of a teenager's room 
so I had the door open with mess everywhere and stuff. And I was drawing out the door and everything and started doing it. And he, he just came over and said, oh, I don't think you can draw large scale. And I just, wow. I said, fuck you in my head. But then I I took it internally and uh, got angry with myself and dropped out of his class. I don't mm. know if it was straight away or soon after anyway. Um, and then I didn't, I didn't talk to anyone about it. I sh- uh my parents weren't really there to discuss school. I didn't feel comfortable talking to them or saying anything to friends. I just dropped out and that was it. Um, <clears throat> but then I did, um, I moved to another art class, which was um, more of a vocational one. So the A-level one is more, I guess, more academic. But I did a, moved to a GMBQ and it was a mo- lot more kind of, um, uh, it was a smaller group and it was a lot less, uh, they were a lot more encouraging, I guess. Um, mm. uh, but then I did want to go on to do, um, uh, to go to art college, but then um, I, at that time I just had really bad social anxiety and I didn't, I couldn't imagine myself moving away from home and dealing with all that stuff. It just, um mm. Like I like to say now, I've done a lot of working it, work on it, and um, I can't remember who said this, but um, being anxious in that way is using your imagination imagination in the wrong way. So I, instead of um, like you do with art, you're imagining a scene or a picture you want to paint. I was creating my own picture of how. I imagined university to be, and I thought that I couldn't manage with that. Um, and, I, and I have the space to see that now, but at the time it felt true that if I went to that scenario, it would be absolutely terrible. Um, hmm. Yeah, so it was... Um, hmm. Yeah, it definitely provoked a strong reaction. I just totally dropped out of it, and... Um, I did hear a funny, <laughs> a funny story about him. Um, so I had an exhibition last year, and I, I invited my art teacher, um, the one previous to this guy. She was really lovely. She was my high school art teacher, so before um, the A levels. Um, so I think it's the same as because uh, in America you stay uh, stay at school to eighteen. So I was fifteen. Uh, uh, yeah, between 15 and 18. Oh, no, sorry. Um, between 14 and 16, this separate art class, uh, Miss mm-hmm. Fearbold. Mm-hmm. I invited her along to my art exhibition last year. It was so lovely to see her. She looked exactly the same about 25 years later. And she was telling me this guy, um, he said I couldn't draw. He, he ended up getting fired from the job because he was he was lying about his qualifications. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> wow so he was projecting yeah <laughs> he was projecting onto you his own insecurity i mean of course yeah. you can't see that when you're 16 no but what an illegitimate thing to say and what an illegitimate thing to do and i'm sorry for him and look at mm. you you know i i find you very successful i realize you're not as mm. successful as you'd like to be but um i find you very successful that is so mm. interesting and okay yeah so so that's not a, de- a defining thing any longer. Um, no. I feel like at this point, I'd like to show people. So here's a neat piece uh, that you created of nine pieces. Uh, so some of those are from 2019 until last year from looking at those. Yeah. There's an enormous variety. So this far left one over here is a mural. It's the top gorgeous. left, yeah. Yeah. What is, and it's got someone in a mask, which we all now know is about COVID usually. Yeah. Um, what is that yeah. one? I wonder if I yeah, can Yeah, this was it. a lot of fun. This was, um, mm-hmm. um, I did this with Harry, Harry Deering, who's a, uh-huh. an artist, um, local artist. She's brilliant a big fan of her work um so we collaborated on this and the only theme was um a tribute to the nhs national health service in 
in the UK. Um, right. The, so the, the guy, health service we envy over here. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh, both, yeah, yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. the health service, many people moan about here, but it's actually pretty good considering. Considering, yeah, they should all yeah. get moved to the US for a week. But yeah. it's okay. I mean, I understand yeah. they should moan. I'm sure it can be better. Uh-huh. Yeah. So it um, had to be a tribute to the NHS. Yeah, so it's it's on the side of the guy's house. Um, he approached us. Mm. Um, his wife is a NHS nurse, and it was kind of a a little tribute to her and the NHS as a whole. Um, so with these kind of projects, this is what we most enjoy because there's no kind of approval process or. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I yeah. bet that can get hairy. Yeah. No pun, no pun intended. Who is the figure? <laughs> the figure behind the person with the mask. So it looks uh, like. So an... this. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. This is um. So it's basically a, um, like a, uh, nineteen kind of nineteen fifties nurse versus a nurse today. So the one okay. on the left is the modern nurse. One on the right is right. the. Uh, the older nurse, the um, older, nurse. older generation nurse. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah, carry on. Well, what's up with the fish? So long, yeah. things for all the fish. Tell me about the fish. Yeah, it seems random, but the there's generally always a reason. So um, the mm -hmm. there was a little tribute. Um, you can't see it on here, but on the top right of this, there's a little fisherman. Um, Mm. Uh, there's someone on this particular street who passed away and it was like a little tribute to this guy who loved fishing mm. and then we decided we wanted to put fish all over the place to, mm. to brighten it up and it's become kind of a little attraction for uh, mm. for children walking past and they stop and look at it and take photos and stuff uh, so there's fish all over this side and then all over to the right hand side as well it's just yeah that was kind of the finishing piece and then um the the fish next to the rainbow that is uh that's like a local nod there's a, a pub called this the dolphin one. just around the corner that one yeah uh-huh yeah, so that's the logo for the for the pub oh nice yeah what town is it in uh, it's in swindon oh in that's also town. in swindon where you live yeah. so we're gonna if we're talking about murals there it is so this wonderful blog post that how do I do something really means can I have permission to do mm. something? And so this is all about murals. Yeah. So this is the wall. This is the before yeah. picture. And I'm going to let me actually not scroll so fast. So this is the before picture. And this is kind of uh, the arch opposite. Yeah. That was the inspiration of it. Yeah. Right. I love it. Like, Where in the hell did you decide to get? Where did you get that? You decided to transpose those arches onto that, frankly, not very attractive wall. Yeah. Well, the, and, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah say the it. funny thing about that was um, I, I wrote in the story that I didn't prepare for this meeting and um, <laughs> I didn't have particularly um, any ideas. So, this arch here was opposite the cafe where we met around right. the corner from this. And I looked out the window and I just thought, oh, this paint there is. And then I mentioned it to them. And it ended up, yeah, being a good idea. Um, yeah. Well, the other thing about it is that you didn't take all the all the arches for yourself. You took them for other people, which is yeah. classic, classic smart. You're very, <laughs> um, you're very sharing. You're very giving. You're very inclusive. I want to see if there's any other. I think there's one more picture. There we go. Yeah, see that's the end get one. It, get it to be bigger. Um each a different style, each a different artist. It's brilliant. This is what Thank the you. wall ended up looking like. Yeah. So not only mm. is it beautiful and inspiring, but it's um, it's communal. But it's it's not all about me. It's about us and what we might do. Yeah. So you did all the negotiating. You did the permissions process, that famous approval process that you're talking about. And this is some amazing press that you guys got. Give yourself permission and start. The... Yeah. Well, I, I didn't get the initial permission for the wall, but I did. I was... Um... Serendipitously. Yeah. yeah, there's okay. a, yeah. <laughs> um, the beneficiary? I, well, I was working with... Um, I contacted this uh, our local councillor um, for the area. And I asked him if he knew who the landlord was. 
and he was in touch with this landlord previously and he got the permission. <clears throat> as soon as we got the permission, I set up a GoFundMe page and then within two weeks we got the got funding from local residents. I mean, and um, you you did that. You you fundraised. I understand they yeah. gave the money, but you did the asking, mm. which is the hard part for most people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like I mentioned in the article, <clears throat> it was um, like at first it, it actually was about me. I must admit I wanted to. Good. The ego. Well, I don't wanna, I'm not going to talk about ego, but I just wanted to. I wanted to prove to myself that I could paint something big and I was going to do it all myself. But then then I thought, why don't I just make it a community thing? I, I think that's what I end up doing. Sometimes I think, oh, I'll do this big thing myself and then it ends up being with other people. So um, that must be where my heart takes me. Um, but yeah, the arches worked out well because there's 10 arches and then 10, 10 of the right people turned up. And they're all in Swindon? All the artists are in Swindon? Yeah. So that's another mural in Swindon. Swindon's lucky to have you. That's actually um, on the same road as that other one. So the, oh, it is. The, this one we're talking about, and then I did uh, the NHS one a couple of months after that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so here's someone who says he's shy and not really into being very visible. And mm. you're, you're like super visible. You're visibly the presence behind this wall. You're visibly raising money, which is excruciating for a lot of people, and mm. you're visibly putting your own work right out there. So to me, that's also an edge. And what yeah. in you allows you to not tiptoe to that edge, but get to that edge and go over it? Mm. I think it's when I stop thinking about myself. Um, mm. I'm just doing what I like, love doing, and it just happens yeah hmm. that drives me more than more than anything I like like you were saying I I probably describe myself as shy too much nowadays because I'm not particularly I just I'm more of an accepting um introvert I guess mm. um nice like you were saying about uh was it about Thanksgiving and stuff, a lot going on and you're looking forward to peace and quiet? I, I feel the same. I'd like, I do like bouts of going to busy galleries and chatting to people, but then I need the rest after that. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think the only thing in the way of, of me is uh, in the only thing in the way of, getting to the next level of my art career is me now there's no there's no barriers really it's just it's not even seeing a clear path I don't think it's about applying what I've actually done and in the past and I don't know taking that going deeper into that I suppose I've done I don't want to blow my own trumpet, but I've since no, you should blow 20, your own trumpet. 2019, I have actually. I've probably done more than a lot of artists have ever dreamed of doing, which I feel like a dick for saying. But ah, Good, go ahead. Feel like a dick and say it anyway. <laughs> I want to hear you say it. And the people who are watching this want to hear you say it. We need to say those things. I mean, you're yeah. saying something really hard, which is I'm totally responsible for my art career. That's the I first am. thing you said. Like there isn't another barrier but me and, and I'm not going to be a barrier. And I've achieved a heck of a lot and compared to other artists. Also, yeah, I have. Yeah, we don't I, need to compare ourselves, but you have. It helps you understand that you have. Yeah, and I need to acknowledge that to move forward as well. I can't keep doing mm -hmm. things and thinking I haven't done anything because it's not true. Um, right. I've done a lot of exhibitions. I've set up my own exhibitions. I see extremely talented artists who have, who are technically better than me, but they just don't take action as well. So I, I get it, but I need to praise myself for what I've done. You have a lot of moxie. How do you set up your own exhibitions? Um, what are some ways just, you do that? I just book a venue and a date and then... I sound I say that quite flippantly now, but I yeah, did... Yeah, you um, do. <laughs> 
it it feels easy to me now um, mm. because I don't know if you've heard of Landmark Education. I don't know if I, I think I might have talked to you about it before. I did their courses years ago. <clears throat> I've done when I was oh, you have I, as well. Yes, yeah. uh, yes, I did Est long ago, oh, which is yeah. what originally, yeah, yeah in the nineteen seventy nine. Yeah. I did it. Yeah, no, yeah, I didn't cool. know that you had done that. Yeah. Oh, I thought I told you, but I did it in um. 2018 this is when I was actually struggling with social anxiety so I couldn't I found it hard to get a job and stuff like that that was when it was a reality for me um then I went on the landmark forum and didn't particularly change much but I did um this thing called the self-expression and leadership program Mm. um I don't know if they would have done that back in the S days but it was Mm. But the reason I did it was this project focus. So you have three months mm. in small teams and you have a coach who coaches the whole team. You have to set up a, a community event at the end of it. Um, mm. So I set up this social anxiety event um, uh, in London. So I wanted, I set the date, first of all, booked to venue <clears throat> and then worked backwards. So I had a coach there, had my the rest of my team all setting up events as well. Um, so I set up a website for it, started promoting it. Um, and then I think it was about six weeks before I got an op- opportunity to speak to Ruby Wax. I don't know if you, do you know who she is? She's. A, I didn't until I saw your interview. I think. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. She's from Chicago originally, but she's been in London for <coughs> many years. Um, and I got to speak to her, and then I, I invited her to come along and open the event. And a part of me was, was like, no, she's not going to come. She's famous, and why would she come and come to my event? So I spoke to the producer, and she said, oh, she'll probably be too busy. But then, mm. I, I kind of said, oh, okay. So I spoke, I did the interview with Ruby, and we had a really good connection. And then. I asked her in person and she, she said, yes, I'll, I'll be there. Um, and then, uh, six, uh, I think it was about four weeks later or something, the event happened <coughs> and there was about 80 people there, people who were shy, who had social anxiety, had enough courage to come along to this event, um, try these different workshops. So it had like, uh nlp cbt um hypnotherapy um laughter therapy yoga massage all, all sorts of little mm. little sessions you could try just to wow. get an idea of what kind of support you can get and that was really life-changing for me as well as the people who attended because i proved to myself that i could do something that i didn't think was possible <clears throat> So that's why I sound flippant when I set up events now. It feels like nothing to me. Um, <laughs> in a way that it's like if you're tying your shoelace, um, one day um, when you're a child, it was nearly impossible to do, wasn't it? You're like, you'll never get that. But with running events, it I don't get stressed about it. I don't. It, it just kind of happens. When I decide an event's going to happen, it happens. Wow. I love your stories. Um, Mm -hmm. I want to jump into your slideshow. Looks nice. All right. So this is your brand, Slark, like we talked about. And here's a piece. I invited you to choose, I think, five pieces. Tell me, tell us about this one that had something to do with an edge also. Yeah. So um, I was a big wrestling fan when I was a child, uh, WWF wrestling. Um, Uh Hulk Hogan was, uh, he was like one of the, I think he was probably the guy he became super famous back in the late 80s early mm-hmm. 90s. oh yeah um i know him. And he, yeah um so i i'm basically replacing andre the giant so i'm oh. I'm, I'm i'm staring him in the face this is a mm. a scene from wrestle <clears throat> wrestlemania 3 um but it has some meaning behind it it's um it's basically about masculinity and because I was quite a shy sensitive child and overweight I kind of looked up to these these kind of heroes they were 
often like uh, over six foot tall, some of them like seven foot tall, uh, big macho guys, um, really super confident as well. Obviously, a lot of that was um, mm. acting as as I knew uh, later on, but having that kind of presence and personality and charisma, I guess I was living vicariously by watching them uh, on the TV. And in a way, me squaring up to him is kind of proving proving my my strength, my worthiness as a man, and my mm. um, that I'm uh, that I'm good enough, like I'm tough enough as well. Um, you and can also, also see it. Yeah, yeah, carry on. Well, and also that your way of being a man is different to his, but nonetheless, still a way of being a man. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I know that now. I, I kind of, a lot of the time I thought you had to kind of mm. be more macho to be a man and something was missing or lacking. But In this image, you look formidable, but you also look vulnerable. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that was done on purpose, yeah. Yeah, I've never yeah. seen the original with Andre the Giant, but to us, to the viewer, you've got your front exposed. He's got his back exposed. Anyway, it's a it's very great. Um, I want to find my cursor, and we'll go to the next image. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tell us. Yeah. So this was part of that mural. This was my my section. Uh, okay. <clears throat> This is my arch, um, the second one along. <coughs> and there was a funny thing about the second space as well, because I really wanted the first space. Uh, oh, right. Because the second uh, space has these grills in it, right? No, it, well, it wasn't that, actually. It was just because oh. it was nearer the road and oh. more exposed. But <laughs> Okay. Someone with a bigger personality than me had the first space, and I... Mm. I wasn't really reluctant. I was like, it's okay, you can have it. I didn't feel like mm -hmm. I was pushed into it. Yeah, I wasn't grudging it. Mm. Grudging. Um, so this is a tribute to my... Um, so after, when I dropped out of my art class, um, when I finished A-levels, I went on to do multimedia. So um, mm. this was more um, graphic design and web design and stuff like that. So this guy, Paul Moss, he was one of the tutors on the course and he was hmm. one of the nicest people you would ever meet. He would, um, hmm. he would give me so much extra, extra support and he would, um, we played basketball together. This was outside of class and in his own time, which was really lovely uh, just because he wanted to. Wow. And I also heard that he, um, another artist associate that I know, um, this guy, Paul, he drove him uh, 60 miles to this university in Cardiff, which is in Wales, um, wow. just to go to an open day. Uh -huh. um, uh, so this guy um, didn't believe in himself uh, about going to university. So Paul encouraged him and took him there. And then he ended up studying there and did really well. Wow. Um, that's the kind of guy he was. He would do so much for the students. Um, and then he, yeah, he passed away on, um, when was it? 2022, yeah, July 2nd. Yeah. Oh, no, it's the other way around here, isn't it? 2nd of February. Oh, sorry, no, 7th, 7th of February. February. Yeah. Right. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so I really wanted to do a tribute for him. Um, when we were doing this, when I was planning out the mural, this I was going to do a huge tribute to him on the whole wall. Mm. Um, so that was that's how the whole thing started. My my drive for that to do a tribute for Paul. Um, that was the whole idea behind it. But when I got the community involved, they understandably said they didn't know who this person was, and he wasn't mm -hmm. he didn't live in this particular part of the town. Mm. Um, so rather than doing that, I opened it up to more of a local community. Um, theme 
so it was all uh, around Swindon and the local local area so by where this was painted where they used to build all the trains um have you heard of Isambard Kingdom Brunel before no um he basically built the uh the great western railway so it goes from oh wow um testing my history I think it goes all it definitely goes from Bristol to um London okay. um so before that there was no <clears throat> no quick way to get between cities hmm. um so he he was part of that and the railway works in Swindon and um built the Clifton suspension bridge in Bristol which is <clears throat> I don't know if you've seen it but it's a it's an absolutely beautiful bridge uh, this was built in like the I don't even know when it was built but it's over 150 years ago or something like that okay um so yeah some of the other um uh, murals in this project were around the kind of railway history and mm. things like that so tell um, us a bit about this i'm curious about the elements in this painting yeah sure um so he paul was into he was into films and star trek so okay <clears throat> on the left hand bit next to his name you've got the uh, mm -hmm. You know, the Dr. Spock sign. Right, the Vulcan salute. Vulcan, mm -hmm. that's it, right. yeah. yeah. And on the right-hand side, there's a video camera sign. Okay. <clears throat> um, and then you've got someone being beamed up, like the, the saying, oh, beam me up, Scotty. okay. So it's beam me up, Motty. Right. And he was, he was good at beaming people up, it sounds like. Yeah. And also, when he passed on, he was... Being beamed, being beamed up. up, yeah. Lovely. And what about this building? Um, that's kind of the landmark of Swinton. It's, it's the only kind of, there's not really any skyscrapers here. So this is a mm. um, kind of an art deco, um, mm. 20 story mm. um, block of flats in the town centre. Mm. <coughs> Right. Excuse me, but because it's a such a rural town, you can see it from miles away, and it's it's a bit of a focal point, really. It's, mm -hmm. They used to have a um, um, a cafe at the top and an observation deck, but they're, that's no longer there. But you'd mm -hmm. you'd be able to see for miles from there. Oh, I um, love places like that. Yeah. And is this over here? Is that the Swindon skyline? Yeah, that's supposed to be like a bit of a, mm -hmm. a background skyline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love the background colors, actually. I love the stars and these swirls. All right, yeah. I'm going to keep keep going to the next piece. This is a really wild piece. I mean, talk about edgy and vulnerable. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. And it's your choice. I mean, this is one you chose. So, yeah, love it. Yeah. It's, um, Tell us about it. Yeah, it's... I, I never planned to paint a nude of myself but I with um seeing other people's art I saw this um uh this piece from someone called Glenn Pudvine P-U-D-V-I-N-E mm. and he drew quite a lot of nudes of himself um mm. they're really surreal so his mm. his penis was like strangling himself and stuff like oh that my and God, I, that's it's really mad right I have no idea what he's getting at but um, it's pretty cool and mm -hmm. I, I would get really triggered by it like mm. felt really insecure and kind of weird by his um, or by you doing it for yourself by his by his uh -huh, uh -huh. and that drove me to face my own body insecurities and paint something myself um, so yeah I started I started from a reference photo of myself and it Mm -hmm. I just felt really uncomfortable and vulnerable doing it, but and that's what made you want to do it. If I know, yeah, you. that's what that's why I think. That, so the title for this interview, like I said, really just I pulled right out of my ass is what I said. I don't know where it <laughs> came from, but um, when I think of you, I think edginess just pervades, permeates everything you do. That you you so here's the scary thing, and you're like, oh, I guess I better do that. <laughs> because yeah. it's because it's scary because it makes you uncomfortable i love that um no yeah you are right it's 
even though it is uncomfortable, I think it's, I'd rather do that all day, every day than mm. paint boring stuff for other people. I mean, you do um, paint things for other people. Let's be clear. You do take commissions, but you don't paint boring things for other people. Yeah. I mean, kind of like, mm. I don't know. I do. Yeah. Just, yeah. You like, you like Stuff to with yourself. too much, yeah, too much instruction or <clears throat> too many guidelines. I think mm -hmm. it, need, it needs to have my own creativity in it. And it, I think um, it it needs to have an edge, is what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. So with with this, I've I've shared it in uh, my exhibition last year, and I wasn't. I strangely didn't feel any kind of um, <laughs> apprehension about it. It was just. It was just there. I had family members there as well, and I wasn't. Wow. Wasn't bothered. <laughs> and there you were walking around. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Here, here's another one, also edgy and vulnerable in a different way. You're obviously wearing a lot more clothing, but this is you. <laughs> yeah. And I don't just mean this, I mean this painting Oh, that one, you. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why yeah, did you so... choose this one? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so this one, um, I don't even know why I took the reference photo. I, well, I probably do, because I was kind of feeling sorry for myself. Mm. Um, so uh, this was my first dialysis session in hospital uh, at the end of 2021. Mm. Um, wow. I think it was the 16th of December. So I was feeling really ill. I was extremely cold. This was when I was in the hospital. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. I had two jumpers on and a woolly hat on and a mask. And I was just... I just really needed this treatment. I took the photo. And then about four weeks later, after having treatments, I was well enough to go back down the studio again. So I printed out this photo that I took of myself and I really wanted to paint it. Mm -hmm. um, so this, I think this is the first painting of this size I did. So the, the blue one, the blue man that I showed you previously. Um, mm -hmm. I can't remember if I finished that after this, but the, well, anyway, this is one of the first large paintings I did. So when we talk about going to the edge, I wasn't, I, I didn't feel comfortable in my, confident in my abilities in painting something this size. So it's <laughs> for my. So rep, of course you yeah. did it. Uh huh. Yeah, um, so if, uh, you can see the perspective of I'm six foot two, so this this is about four foot by three foot, the right. painting size. Um, so I just took it step by step and hmm. felt quite fearful, not fearful, there wasn't anything to be afraid of, but apprehensive and hmm. um, worried about it being any good, but it was just an amazing process facing that head on um it was a very cathartic experience expressing how it was um through that period as well and it and again after doing something it's proving to myself that i can face up to things and do them um mm. and i realize when i'm saying this out loud it there's no reason why i can't apply this to um um making this an art career um, That's right. to replace my job as well so there's there's more to be explored on that next year anyway definitely mm. well, well yeah. said well said wonderful here's the last one i think is the last one i'm not sure this is amazing i don't know that i've seen this one no i don't think i've shared it that much um it's first beautiful. time i've shared it in public mm. <clears throat> so i had the idea um as you know, I've ever since I come across the phrase "memento mori," uh, remember mm -hmm. your mortality in mm -hmm. Latin. Um, it's really um, it's been a useful phrase for me, and uh, this um, you can't really see in the background, but I bought a a real newspaper from 
I can't remember the exact date, but it was 1871 or something like that. Uh, the Times newspaper from London, um, an actual newspaper pasted on the back of it yeah. um, behind this board here. Um, on top of the board, sorry, then paint on top of it. <clears throat> so the idea behind it was anyone who read that newspaper or wrote in that newspaper or advertised in that newspaper, they're all dead. Um, mm. Harsh reality. They, Someone one day is reading that newspaper, living their life as normal, having a cup of tea or whatever, and every person in that generation is has moved on now. Mm. Um, that doesn't have to be a harrowing mm. thought it's just the nature of life and there's a message in it <clears throat> that we should live our live our lives basically um, oh. so you've got the grim reaper there and then someone who's dressed in uh, kind of Victorian attire in front of, the, in front of him oh. he's, yeah, he's no longer around and kind of sheltered by the death figure. Yeah. They look they look sort of like they're in death's cloak or something. Yeah. Wow. So what year did you do this piece? Um I can't I think it was early no, it wasn't earlier this year, it was last year actually. Uh -huh. Um towards the end of last year. Wow. Like a year yeah. after you did the piece in the in the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, Very no, it's that same year, but at the other end of the year. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Mm. And why do you think you haven't shown it so much, this piece? Will you be showing it more? Yeah. Um, well, the funny thing was, actually, I <clears throat> I wasn't sure if it was finished before, but then I left mm. it for a long time. Um, yeah. <clears throat> and then I decided to display it at my recent uh -huh. exhibition and it, and it feels ready to me um mm. i think it's a blessing that i can i can decide it's ready because i know a lot of artists are perfectionists mm. and they have had the most granular detail or whatever it's up to them but i don't i kind of feel when it's ready hmm. wow we're getting to the end of the time and i also know that you have a child and I think you have mm -hmm. to go do something for your child. I wanted to mention your upcoming art show. So you've got this thing called the Affordable Art Fair in New York, yeah. which is charming and interesting. And yeah, I'm making right. a note of things I can put, I can stick a slide of that in the final version of this. Is there anything um, for all your people in the UK or elsewhere that you want to mention where you're, you've got shows coming up? Um. I haven't got anything else planned yet. Um, okay, so people should subscribe to your Substack and they'll find out. Yeah, there's definitely okay. going to be stuff going on next year. But I know you. Yeah. Yeah, it's not um, fully planned yet. Yeah. That's great. Mm. Okay, listen. Thank you so much. This was so rich. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to love listening to yourself. Also, by the way, just saying. Okay. <laughs> Mwah. All right. See ya. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. You as well.